it is because of his mercies that we have not been consumed because his compassion faileth now his compassion is like the rain it doesn't fail we worship you oh god we start our journey with you on a note of reverence acknowledging the greatness of thy power the covenant that is in your law the power that is in your grace the capacity that is in your long suffering glory be to the name of the lord our god oh god we give you the glory because of the great victory that you will establish tomorrow it doesn't matter what men have done it doesn't matter what strategies they are running with you the grand manipulator will cause them to exert their enemy their energy to accomplish what will ultimately become your intention no one can fight you no one can battle with you for if the princes of this world had known they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory thank you father in Jesus mighty name you may be seated amen we began to talk about prayer the emptiness that was found in the visible creation after the rebellion of man so many technocrats so many wise people tried to formulate a form of existence to consolidate the fallen state of humankind and it doesn't matter how much they tried to sell that falling lifestyle by building systems to sustain it the emptiness therein was so loud and it came to pass in Genesis chapter 4 that men found they stumbled upon a possibility and they decided to explore that possibility and that's calling upon the name of the Lord and that began during the time of Enos the son of Set a people had risen upon the face of the earth an exodus was taking place a migration in search of what humankind had lost and then men began to call upon the name of the Lord by the time we get to the book of Genesis chapter 6 Noah one of the chief intercessors of those days stumbled upon a discovery he found grace hallelujah by the time we go to Genesis chapter 8, that's where we're going to start from. Because it's supposed to be a panoramic view of the entire book of Genesis. And then we'll see how men began to discover things in the spirit. And that began to form the basis and the platform of the spiritual heritage that formed the nation of Israel. Are you there in Genesis chapter 8? We'll begin from verse 20. Genesis 8 from verse 20. This Noah that found grace in the sight of God now made another discovery. He was the first man that initiated what we call priesthood. He discovered the science of the possibility of the interface between the natural and the supernatural. And he decided to consolidate upon the discoveries that he had made. And in the book of Genesis chapter 8 from verse 20, the Bible says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. This is the first altar that was ever raised in human history 
that was raised unto the Lord. Prior to this time, there were altars raised to demons, to devils, to spirits, to fallen angels, to spirits in the forest, to spirits on the mountain. But this altar was not raised unto Amadioha. It was not raised unto Shongo. It was raised unto the Lord. Now, are you still with me? Now, they were... Oh, my. We don't have time. Because you would think it is easy for you to raise an altar unto the Lord. There were many people that took off like a tornado. Are you with me? They went on a drive fast and they said they wanted to encounter God. At the end of the period of the fast, they ended up in the psychiatric hospital. It was obvious that they encountered something, but not God. Meanwhile, they raised an altar. And in their mind, it was unto the Lord. But what visited them took them to psychiatric hospital. And we had to go to pray for them, for their mind to come back, their soul to be secure. You may not know, but this man went into a grievous, a deep research before he came up with the technology of, on how to raise an altar that Amadioha will not claim that Ogugu will not claim. An altar that when he begins to sacrifice upon it, it is the Lord's frequency that he will contact. Noah, that was the result of the grace he found. He became a researcher into spiritual things. And he, he, he was able to raise an altar unto the Lord. The Bible says, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, Noah, are you with me? It was in the book of Exodus that Moses by inspiration of the Lord was able to do some form of categorization and classification. And some animals were classified to be unclean. And some animals were classified to be clean. The nomenclature of clean and unclean animals was not yet out. But how did this man know which creature was clean? And meanwhile, for your information, what the Bible means by clean creature is a creature that retained his manual, his operational manual after the fall. There were several creatures that were totally, they experienced a mutation. They lost their original manual. The way they were ordained by God to function. They lost it after the fall. Because the, the fall affected the very principle of the physical world. It affected it. Hallelujah. Every other insect has a culture. A culture of drawing nectar from flowers. And that's why insects are, are useful in cross-pollination. Hallelujah. But when the fall of man came, mosquito, mosquito forgot that his, his, his food is inside of flowers. He starts taking blood. That's a sign of the fact that he had lost the manual. So everything went out of course. The Bible said they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. That was the result of the fall of man. It affected the fabric, the very fabric and foundation of the physical world. This man I don't know by what wisdom he was able to understand that there were some creatures that the fall did not affect. It's just like um, um, uh, God is good. That God is good. Okay. God is good is not here. Nya Nya must translate. Is that what they call it? Or new Nya Nya must translate. The boss that new Nya Nya uses is an 18-seater boss. Is that so? So you have two people sitting in the front and 16 people in the rest of the vehicle. God forbid, but imagine that there was an accident. 18-seater bus with one driver. And the accident was ghastly. Three people died instantly. Alright? Four others, their bones were broken. And if you raise them up, the leg will move in, in ways that if the bone was still in order, that leg cannot sustain that motion. Are you with me? Imagine also that in the same bus there were three people 
that came out without a scratch. That's how the fall was. The impact of the fall was different for each creature. Just like the impact of the accident was different for each person that was in the vehicle. The sun came out, no scratch. You can't even trace anything. You run a test and you see that they are clean. That's the ideology of the clean and the what? And the unclean creatures. And the Bible says that Noah took of the clean creatures and he offered a bond sacrifice unto God. It means this man has been conducting some research. Before the list of clean creatures came out, he had already tapped into it in the frequency of the spirit because he found grace. I pray that your Christian life, your adventure in the spirit will download something that generations after you will still refer to in order for them to connect with some frequencies in God. He offered burnt offerings. Not unto Amadioha, but unto God. This is the first time in the Bible that the Bible recorded that a man advanced an initiative of prayer and heaven responded. Prior to this time, people prayed, but we were never told that heaven responded. The frustration of lack of answers to prayer was what invaded, what, what characterized the field of this new endeavor, the endeavor of prayer that humankind had stumbled upon. But in the days of Noah, because of the grace that he found, he was able to discover how to raise an altar unto God. And when he raised an altar unto God, with all the attendant revelations that accompanied the kind of sacrifices that he made unto God, he was able to secure a feedback. Are you with me? But I, I, I want you to see the kind of feedback he secured. And Noah built it, an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Next verse. And the Lord smelled the sweet savour. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore every living thing as I have done. That's when the next verse now comes. As long. As the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not see. He got a feedback from God. But you know, there was something about this feedback. The feedback was not in a proclamation that God made. The feedback was in, in a, an utterance that was made in the heart of God. It was a quiet feedback. That means that if you don't know how to enter into God's heart, you cannot get this feedback. The reason why it is in the Bible is because Noah was able to discover the technology of how to enter the heart archives, the archives of God's heart, and he was able to extract what was the worthy response of his initiative of prayer to the Almighty. Noah was an icon. He was the first of humankind to extract a response from God. If no man of sufficient stature rises in your family to extract an answer from the heart of God as concerning the destiny of that family, the patterns that are there will be sustained. It means that you have not yet found how to exert force in the spirit and how to move the hand of God. If you are still with me, say, I, I know you are sad. You are very sad now. That oh, I, I have not discovered anything in the spirit. Noah, it was upon the discovery of grace that he was able to build this kind of technology. Today, I want to talk about the way of the altar. <laughs> Whereas, listen, listen, you are not with me. Stay with me. Are you there? Stay with me. Whereas, it was Noah 
that discovered the technology of how to erect an altar. And the discovery is Noah's, just like in science. All right? You might find several principles, several theories that are already propounded. And then when you come to the science class, they teach you the already existing principles and theories. And then they establish, sometimes they give mathematical uh, ways of verifying the efficacy of the principles. And then when you are supposed to do your project, you use the principles you were taught in order to see how you can solve a problem in your own climb. An application of all the things that you have learned. Alright, that's what we did in school. So Noah made this discovery, but it was in the life of Abraham that the principle of the altar was maximized. Now, so I want you to see that there's a, there's, there's a progression. Oh my God. Are you, are you with me? There's a progression. The first, the take up point was that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That never happened before. And when they began to call upon the name of the Lord, we were not told God answered. Until a man came, his name was what? Noah. And then among the people calling upon the name of the Lord, he found grace. When he found grace, the result of the grace he found was the technology of all tasks that he discovered. Is that clear? And then another researcher comes two chapters later. This researcher, his name is called Abraham. He takes advantage of existing principles that were propounded and discovered by previous researchers before his time. And what was obvious, the obvious and most recent discovery in the spirit was the technology and the discovery of altars. So the life of Abraham was a life of the tent and the altar. Everywhere he went, he raised an altar. Come with me quickly. How I wish we had time to work this out. Genesis chapter 12. Quickly. Quickly. And before you know it, in the entire scope of the Middle East, Golan Heights, everywhere in the Middle East, the man had littered the place with altar. But, but, stay with me. He maximized the principle that the last researcher had discovered. Are you there in the book of Genesis chapter 12? Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Next verse. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken unto him and Lot went with him and Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all the substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Many times they tried to go to Canaan. They stopped somewhere. Many times they took off to go to Canaan. They stopped in Haran. Many times they... But this time, this time around, when Abraham was the one that was in charge of the, the navigation party, they, they intended to go to Canaan. And they arrived at Canaan. Glory to God. Then when they arrived in Canaan, Bible says, and Abraham passed through the land into the place of Sikkim. This is spiritual mapping. We don't have time for this now. And into the plain of More. And then there's a commentary. There's a commentary. A quiet commentary. That uh, is given here, which is going to be necessary in a few verses from now. And the Canaanites was then in the land. He was mapping. The Canaanites were there. They, they didn't know that what he was doing was mapping when he moved to, to More. He was mapping the territory. And the Bible gave a quiet commentary. What did he say? And the K 
Canaanites. They, they were there in the land. But they never knew, the Canaanites never knew that the true inheritor, the true heir of the entire expanse of that land had come. The Canaanites never knew that the cup of their iniquity was already filled up. Hallelujah. It is because of the cup of their iniquity that was almost, it was not filled up yet, it was almost going to be filled up that the hair from God was sent into the territory. It was after Abraham came that the, a clock began to tick in heaven. And according to that clock, it will take 400 years from the time that Abraham came into the land of Canaan for the iniquity of the Amorites to be full. And if that happens, it will be the land itself that will eject the Amorites. And that's why the Bible said they got not the land by their, by their soul. It was not because of military might. There was a spiritual thing that was at work. So Abraham knew that if he fought the, 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 the Canaanites, the time he came, he would not win. Because at that time, their cup was not yet full. These men operated with a kind of wisdom. Ah, ah, ah. I am Okali Masika. He said, okay. Are you there? Please. If you can, give us the scripture again. And, he, he, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham. And said, unto thy seed will I give this land. So it means heaven had registered that he had entered. So the clock in heaven began to count from this day that Abraham entered to 400 years. In the which period Israel was going to be incubated in the land of Egypt. Because at that time it was only the land of Egypt that had the resources to sustain such a people. Eh? So they are going into Egypt was calculated by God as a time that will fill the window of 400 years wherein the cup of the iniquity of the Amorites will be full. And in those days there will be nourished from the resources in the land of Egypt because that was the only nation that had the resources to sustain them. So it began to come from this day. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed would I give this land. And then, what? There, he did what? He builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. I hope you know by this time, he was building this altar. He didn't know the name of the God that he built it. I need to take you through 12 altars before it was a generation after him that gave the God of that altar a name. It was in the days of Isaac. So research has continued. My question to us today is what have you found in the spirit? So that when your son runs to you at the age of 12, the age of 18, saying the days of my navigation, this, I found this. I found that. On the strength of this and that, do not do this. So that your children can become the seed of the wise. I made up my mind long time ago that I would not live a mundane life. Get a job in Zenith Bank and look for a pair of suits. And you appear there on Monday. You fill vouchers, regulate and collate cash inflow. You balance the amount in your computer before you close and go back home. And tomorrow you are now with a blue suit on the same desk. If that's the meaning of your life, it means you know your job and you don't know your work. Because whereas the Canaanites were in the land, this man was doing mapping. And what he was doing was deeper. The meaning of what he was doing was deeper than just the natural mundane state of existence. I will not be like Methuselah. He lived and died and his only achievement was that he produced sons and daughters without heritage. Without any spiritual thing to bequeath to them. Should I tell you that time in itself cannot bring deliverance. 
Wise men have changed time. They have manipulated time. And they have established things that will speak as long as the earth remains. He built an altar, the Bible says, unto the God that appeared unto him. This was how I started. I hope you know. Are you still with me? Noah was the one that invented altars to God. He picked it from them. And now God has as much as appeared unto him. He picked Noah's discovery. And he built an altar. And called upon his name. You see, he, he, before this time, God did not appear to him. What made him leave his father's nation? What made him ask to be released from his father's house was the voice of the Lord that was locked in his head. He could not even understand that voice, but he eventually set out at the age of 70 to obey the instruction that he had heard that voice bring. And when heaven saw that he was mobile, he was moving, migrating towards the place where God had set for him an inheritance, God now appeared to him. And when the Lord appeared to him, what did he do first? Altar. If I check your life, I will see many revelations that you had. Many encounters. Many things that God has said to you, but you didn't raise any altar along the line of those encounters. To trap those encounters and to make it your own. Many of you have lost things. You have missed out of things. Most of what you see that is responsible for what becomes a great man in God was an encounter that an altar was raised around. In the first instance, when the things came, they were feeble, they were faint, they were weak things. But when the altars were built around them, many years later, they began to gain strength and capacity and shape and structure. But they came in the most feeble way in order to give muscle and structure to that which came just like a dream of the night and to make it a concrete reality you may need to build an altar it was at the age of 13 that I knew that I was going to preach the gospel but even in the encounters I had I asked a question I asked angels this question hallelujah because I was a grievous stammerer and I said why will God want a stammerer to preach for him? How much can I do to the enterprise of the gospel without the ability to communicate effectively? Those were my words when I was 13 years old. And in the realm where I was asking this human question, they could not understand why I was so ignorant. In that realm. In fact, one of the angels, you know, I found out experientially that angels are very difficult to appease. Because of the question I asked, the scroll the angel was reading, which I have now understood that it was the, the outline of my destiny. If I was a little bit more patient, maybe I would, I would have gotten the entire thing he was trying to read. But I, I punctuated him with my question. And the scroll from whence he read, he he rolled it and struck my tongue. That was how the encounter stopped. I, I found myself in the room again. You know what? I built an altar around that encounter. So that moment, are you with me? I hope you know eternity doesn't have time. Eternity is timeless. It's the realm of a perpetual continuum is the realm of an eternal now. Hallelujah. It's a realm of perpetual presence. Are you with me? Oh, you are not with me. Now, so when you have an encounter from that realm that is timeless, if you have the technology of trapping that encounter, and you build an altar around the encounter. What you have done is that that moment in eternity. Are you with me? That moment in eternity. From whence God secured the window to reach out to you. That moment can live in your life forever. Because.
because you trapped it around an altar. So when God comes with dreams and comes with visions and encounters, he is not in the entertainment business. He is hoping. He is hoping, sincerely hoping that there is a wise man in the earth that will understand that this is the language of the immortals. They speak with pictures. They speak with signs and symbols. And if you trap an altar around it, you can make those weak runes of the spirit a critical part of your existence. And structures will be built around it. And it will live forever. Hallelujah. Somebody was describing his encounter with God. With me. And after describing it, he said, the things were so weak. The vision, he was not sure about it, but this is what he saw. Then I told him, brother, an encounter with God is never clearer than what you saw. It is always something that if you come into your physics mind, you can doubt that nothing happened. Eh? If you subscribe to the chemistry you learned, that everything must be by molecules, by protons, by neutrons and electrons. If you come into that mode, the encounter never existed. But wise men that understand the language of the spirit, what they do is that they build an altar. When I discovered at the age of 13 that I was going to preach the gospel, then my challenge was, how will I talk? And it means the encounter didn't die. It left an impression. May the Lord, may his weak ways of wooing humankind, may it become strong enough for you to build an altar unto the God that appeared unto you. The identity of the personality in the spirit that met him was not really known. But yet as weak as the encounter was, what did he do? He built an altar. It will never be clear by encounter. It will be clear by altar. And that's why in the life of Abraham, altars were permanent and tents were temporary. Because the Bible says, he pitched his tent and then he did what? He built an altar. His living was living by altars. That's what life was for Abraham. You got a posting from Lagos, from Makodi to Lagos. And then you never knew that if you arrive in a new territory, the first thing you do is to pitch your tent. Look, pay rent, pay house rent, pitch your tent. And then when you have pitched your tent, you build an altar. Tents were temporary. Altars were permanent. And when Abraham moves from a place to another place, he takes his tent along. But you know he can't take the altar. That altar becomes a foundation. If I had time, I would have shown you the navigation of Abraham. And that all through the land of Canaan are littered with altars. Today, eh? are you with me? In the Middle East, there may be somebody bearing Malik thinking he wants to fight against God. Eh? One might be bearing Ab Abdul Salam, but he doesn't know that our ancestor, Abraham, before his ancestors were born, there was a navigator that littered altars all through the territory. Oh my! They can only rebel because God gave them permission. God has consistent, he has sufficient evidence in those territories eh? for him to invade. And indeed, in our lifetime, he will invade. Something will be struck at the very heart of Islam. A revival will strike in our lifetime. Not because we pray too much, but because their territory is littered with the efforts of our ancestors. And my prayer tonight is that the labor of our heroes past shall never be in vain. When you find men like Idahosa, what they did, their real ministry was not the churches they established. You will never know them until you trace their altars. I went to Ekiti State. The moment we drove from Ondo State into Ekiti State, I saw people on the mountains and then when I asked them why, what are these people doing here they say ah 
most of the labors of the great prophet Ayo Babalola were done on mountains whereas men dwell in the valleys a strange mortal had appeared that had superior understanding he spent most of his life where on high ground <laughs> I don't have time to talk this evening the body is too much you think the churches that came out of their initiatives was what they did? No. The measure of a man's life are the altars littered that tell the story of his journey because your life in the spirit is a story that God is telling from heaven. Anytime you move into the flesh, the story ends. And maybe you, you revive the story after four months of flesh. Even the angels that are the scribes, they will become confused at your level of conviction. Men like Paul says, we are living epistles. It means that the story that God is telling to us is a very cogent progression of spirit life because of our walk with God. doesn't matter what the story of Makodi is. If wise men are littered across the land, a day will come when what they did on their altar can dethrone a governor. Meanwhile, the Canaanites were in the land they did not know that a navigator had come. This altar that Abraham built, which was the first altar in his endeavor, was the altar of consecration. What he was saying on this altar was through my youthful days you have been disturbing me to follow you. I resisted. But now I have decided to serve your will. Huh? I am taking a risk to follow you. Help my own belief. That's what he was saying on that altar. Because he had not even known the Lord enough to give him a name many believers never get to the point of consecration and this consecration was occasioned by an appearance of god oh my god i don't have time i don't have time today to take us to the book of first john and show us the practice of the altar the altar has a practice it has a practice it has a practice It was when the altars were developed that prayers that were prayed eh, received a feedback from heaven. So we cannot describe an altar except we talk about a spiritual traffic that leads to heaven and that receives from heaven. And the name of that kind of arrangement is what we call fellowship within the context of New Testament provisions. Uh, it, it, it's time now that will not allow me to take us to first John and show us the practice of fellowship because when you, you move from Macaudi to Lagos you are going to encounter principalities that are different from the types that operate here I remember I went to Delta State and I was casting out a spirit from one lady and the demon began to speak from her See, we don't know you here where are you from Ah, because yes you see uh -uh. in my own uh, oh, hallelujah in my own estimation what she was saying was that we know the level of all the people here you are not from here we don't know you here ah you will be ignorant to think that what you did in Makoti will, will follow you to Delta I went to preach in Benin and when we, we, it was in the stadium. I was in the stadium. And I cried to God and people began to manifest. That is, the manifestation was as if somebody put fire on lighter. The whole stadium. Boom! Then we finished. In fact, the, the thing was so strong that security people had to take me away from the, the crusade. Then 
the VC of University of Benin gave me an accommodation. So in the night, I came out of my room and demons, that is, demons were everywhere. In fact, let me tell you the truth, I was afraid. <laughs> Just in case you would think that, I, I, I went back. Take what I saw that <laughs> all the demons were cast out were waiting for me. Outside. <laughs> Don't think that what you did in Makodi will follow you to Bini. No, in Bini you will need to pitch yeah, your tent and then you need to peel an altar. So the first altar he raised was the altar of consecration. Oh my God, my time is up. Second altar he raised is in the book of he raised one in verse 7 raised the other altar in verse 8 Are you there? Are you there in verse 8? And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east and there he built, builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the, you see, at first he didn't know the name, but he called upon the name of the Lord. The first altar he built was, he built it unto the God that appeared unto him. Because he was from a family of a priest. So spirits used to appear unto people. It was common. So the first altar he built, there was a lot of ignorance that was attached to it. But it was an altar nonetheless. When he moved from there, in his dealings on this altar, he had gotten some more insight. So, if you see the way he set up the second altar, he called upon the name of the Lord. There was a personal dimension of his relationship with God that we could see around the second altar. Hallelujah. And you know that the, an altar is not an altar if there is no sacrifice and what we bring on the sacrifice what we bring on the altar that makes it potent is your life your will that is being surrendered every day every day is your will you would have had um the you have ideas to do things the way you want to do it but because you are in a relationship with god that has begun with consecration it means you don't have the right anymore to subscribe to life according to the wits of your will but according to that which is of God. It is that sacrifice of allowing God's will to override yours. That's what the immortals value. Because you cannot say you are trafficking, doing business with, with the realm of immortality. They don't need a car. They don't need money. Huh? But sacrifice moves them. And in your work with God, don't think you will go far if you are not willing to sacrifice. Prayer will eat your time up. And by the time you finish, you, you, have, you started prayer by 12 years and you move it, you continue till 17 years, 22 years, you will find out that you miss something. You miss clubbing, you miss partying, you miss everything. All those things that were happening around the coves were not part of your life. Because you have sacrificed all that. To allow the will of God to find expression. You need the age to master God. You need time to master God. You know the other day I said that you may not master the ways of God any less than 10 years. And I said that in the authority of great men. Great men that started before us. Alright. I found that in Watchman's book. That's the first time I found that 10 year principle. I, the host had told us that that if a man is fake, leave him in 10 years time, you will know the host had told us that directly alright, and then now it is popular, so I preached it here and I said, you will need a consistent work with God for about 10 years eh? for you to say, I know God and it will be true so when I said that they wrote it on Facebook you know, PowerPoint and then a, a young believer 
that doesn't know how many altars I've raised in my navigation. Now commented. I say, somebody posted that thing. All right. So the person now said, go and tell your pastor that he has not been reading his Bible. You got married to your wife, it will take you your lifetime to know your wife. The one that you sleep with, wake up with, you talk, you gist, you travel with, it will take a dimension will appear one day. A dimension. When that dimension appears, don't be angry. Just buckle your seat bears and then enter another school. A friend of mine called me. He's a pastor. He's married for 18 years. He called me and said, he's single. <laughs> yes, he, he said he's single. He has been single. See, it's only me that says he's married. He, he knows it's what he's. When you hear men talk like that, there's a dimension. A human being living with you, dimensions appear, and then you need to begin to learn again. You increase the capacity of your heart to accommodate. Then you want to master a spirit just because you came for a crusade and you say, Jesus, have mercy on me. Then you just. You know, when people that have not had experience with God begin to teach the Bible, what they are teaching is a lie. Don't hear the gospel from a man that has no scars. Paul says henceforth, let no man trouble me because I bear. Why? He spoke. The authority from whence he spoke was from his scars. I bear in my body. I bear what? The marks of Christ. In my navigation, I had marks. And it's the authority that I have to insist that demons cannot trouble me. That an Ezemo cannot come and manipulate my destiny because I have marks. And these marks are not my marks. They are marks I acquired in my adventure as an altar master. <laughs> Friends, oh, oh, they didn't tell you. Please help me tell your neighbor. In this journey, but you will inherit marks. Please help me tell you. <laughs> I know they told you I know they told you it's no longer you that lives it's Christ and that you are a new creation all things have passed away and behold all things have become new oh you are a new species you are a superman before the glory of God dwells in your tabernacle that's, that's a lecturer talking when you begin to build altars, then you will talk the one I'm saying. Tell your neighbor, you will get marks in the process. Hmm. Because the entire ideology of an altar is sacrifice. Oh my God, I don't have time. Okay, jump to Genesis chapter 13 verse 4. You will see another altar. I want to give you an assignment. Go through the book of Genesis, study the life of Moses and give names to all the altars. The first altar was the altar of consecration. All of us. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, salvation met your need. Is that true? But it didn't meet God's need. Have you thought about that? So God's plan cannot be salvation. Because you can give your life to Christ and decide to be an unreasonable Christian. It is only reasonable Christians that decide to go the way of consecration. Because in consecration, your will is sold out. You are no longer living your will. You are living his way. Then you become a prophet to the kingdom of God. It is when you submit to become a functionary in God's kingdom that God profits from your life. Meanwhile, in salvation, you profited from God. Several people are saved today, but they have not allowed God to be the one that caused the shots in their life. Your life, you are a consumer, part of the consumer generation. And I vowed that my efforts in ministry will not be spent at raising consumers. Yes, because in the fullness of time, I will have no reward for that. Oh my God. 
Because if you are going to preach kingdom, you yourself must be an example of a man that is following God in the wilderness. You cannot be fake and preach the kingdom. Because every bit of it requires that, that you die to your will, you die to your ways, you die to your wisdom. And in the New Testament is deeper. All of us will have to bear your cross just like Jesus bore his. And you know when you are carrying a cross, it means you are on that death sentence. Eh? Is that true? And then as you are, they say, okay, you are sentenced to death. They are moving you to where they will do firing squad. Then somebody now say, hey! There is a house that is here in Wadata. Will you buy? Will you buy? You see, you can't desire what the world is offering. If it did, you are carrying what? Cross. Oh, you are not with me. <laughs> oh! The, the attraction of this age will not be reasonable to a man that is what? Or as you are navigating, there's a death sentence. Eh? And you are carrying your cross. Then a woman comes naked. You can't look at it. Have you ever visited a, a labor room when a woman is about to? And then you bring lace and say, I brought lace. <laughs> I brought China list. Eh? This is China. The type you were you talking about. I just got it now. <laughs> go deeper. When you go deeper, you won't need. Uh... Some of you are locked on Chelsea, man. You and you say God to you. You don't know it is stealing your man hours. Your man hours that you would have spent around the altar he's stealing it but it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it's not a sin it's not in the bible when you begin to carry this cross in navigation man you will die mm. you don't need a preacher no you don't need a preacher yes when the protocol of death begins to find expression in your life so that you can really be a sanctuary a new creation you won't need a preacher to preach to you. Those are the days when you hear a voice behind you say, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way. And in those days, every man will have knowledge and understanding of their God. We're a pool of consumers. And somebody was making an observation during the PFN crusade. When you raise a prayer point, we as a body, as a fellowship body, the Pentecostal body, we have no fire corporately. What we are telling people is a lie. Because the proof of our ministry is the people we have raised. And you cannot raise a follower of the cross if you don't carry one. I don't have time. Are you there? Abraham retreated. Decided to take the easy path. So that he will escape process. And he went down to Egypt. It was not God that led him. In Egypt. He was in backsliding mode. Hallelujah. Went to look for greener pasture. That was where. The principality looked upon his wife. May you not give Satan occasion. The wife. We never heard about Sarah. Again. Since that time when her name was taken in the roll call of the journey until Abraham veered off into the land of Egypt and then Sarah became a factor if you are not in the will of God eh, your own may not be Sarah even your, your shirt can be the reason for the trouble but there must be trouble he veered off he wanted to live large so I have been navigating in the backsides for too long I heard there is, there is water bed. There's a beach side that I can go and spread myself under the sun and say, Hallelujah. Ebenezer. Why go back? Keremo Siama. Hayako Masain. When he went there, he didn't know he was locking into the territory of a principality. He was about to meet another fellow 
who was not subject to God and a kingdom was built by his wisdom. He almost lost it. And when he came out of Egypt and he came out because God rescued him, God led him back to the place of the altar which he had made at the first. It is his consecration that God pointed him to when he came back from his backsliding experience. Do you realize anywhere you veer off from, if you veer off any class in the spirit, you veer off from and you don't understand the, the, the journey that God has called us to, to walk in, if you come back, that's the class that we admit you. The teachers in those classes are patient. They are patient to readmit absconded students. Do you see why I say you need time with God? It, take, it takes age for you to master the way of grace. You'll be admitted back to the class that you were attending, that you now took off like a tonic, that will keep your seat and your name will be on it. Maybe you come back at, at age 70, they will say, well done. We will be waiting, we will be waiting. Yes, you, you are seen in primary two. And unfortunately, it's only mortals that need time. Angels don't. God does not. Please help me tell your neighbor, don't waste your time. There were many things I put into consideration before. I, I, okay, okay. This is what I did. I took my Bible. That's 2000. 2000. No, 1999. Put my Bible here. And those were the days I discovered what my knee. Of all the books I read. And I read wide. Read theological masterpieces. I read intelligent presentations. I discovered all those intelligent presentations. The people did not know God. But they spoke bountifully about God. Oh, there was. In, in some of those books you will see. English. Some of them were scholars in English. You could, you, no, no, no. You can't present. The, I, I saw the place of words in describing God. It was deeper than paintings. But I found out most of those people didn't know Jehovah. But when I read Watchman's book, I discovered this man had found God. So I cleared my table of all the other literature. And only what my knee was there for 15 years. I bought any book of his I could find. Because I saw the voice of a man. That was speaking from vast experience in his work with God. Then I knew that there was a difference between a preacher. And a man of God. And I decided I wanted to be a man of God. But you see. Littered across the path of a man of God. Altars. Huh? Come back. Verse 13. They admitted him back to the place he basilated for. Are you there? Finally, before I leave, go to verse 18 of Genesis 13. Ah. Through his navigation, this was where he discovered an airport. Yes, Mamre. We can't talk about Mamre today. It's too deep. It's an airport. It's an obvious portal. The spirit realm can come out of there physically. Mamre. He built an altar there. It was the altar he built there that made it possible for him to notice when the Lord was passing by in the company of two angels. If he had no altar in memory, his encounters would have not continued. Some, some of you, they, God brought you to memory. He was expecting that you would pitch, set up an altar. This was what secured the, alt, the encounters that Abraham had. He pitched an altar in memory. I, I, I won't talk about memory. I won't talk. Not now. Maybe next month. Finally, Finally, I want you to see that Isaac also took on that, that culture. And you begin to see the story of Isaac from Genesis chapter 26. 
As I round up. Are you there? Aye. Give me 26 verse 25 quickly. Yeah, 26, 25. And he built an altar there. That means the altar technology has entered another generation. And there he called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent. This is Isaac. And there Isaac servants dig the well. They were looking for provision. Because if you have water in the desert, you are quite a favored man. Those days, those were the, those days, there was nothing like geological surveys and seismic analysis. There was nothing like sounding in those days. It would take an act of God for you to find water in the wilderness. How did he find water? He pitched a tent. He, he built his altar. After building his altar, through the wisdom he got there, he found where to dig away. Will you, will you stop all the distraction and forget about pursuing all those people that promised to help you and build your altar? Yes, it was in the place of prayer on the 20th of October 2002 in the city of Kano. I will never forget it. 2002, 20th of October because I picked the, I picked, it was 12 midnight. And I had an encounter that lasted for three hours. It was in that encounter I saw a prophetic screen for the first time in my life. A screen that was playing images of the future. And in that screen I saw Makodi. The reason why I'm here today was because I saw Makodi in 2002 in that screen. It was when I had that encounter with that, with, I was seeing that screen and I was asking questions and all of that. It lasted for from 12 midnight to 3 a.m. It was in that encounter that God spoke to me about my wife. You know, it's more than 10 years now, so I can testify. I have been helped. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm a very stubborn man. Very exceptionally stubborn man. Hallelujah. Ah, there are many adjustments I made in my life because of our simplicity. The rugged dimension. I have been helped. When you go in search of a damn cell. <laughs> you know these days. Sisters change when they change hairstyle. <laughs> I saw a sister last month when I saw her. And I, I said, "What's your name?" She said, "Ah, uh -uh. oh, I didn't know it was the, the hair now became like." Maike Samoni Akambela Ami Sabara Kumina Sali. May the Lord open your eyes. God did not call you to marry Miss Delta. Miss, Miss Delta State. Eh? It was at the altar. Altar that was raised that God showed me the future. And he also showed me damn self. May you wake up. Go and look for stones. And begin to erect your altar. Stop chasing men. Stay there long enough. Illumination will come from it. If not, you will run the rat race all through your life. It was here. This, this um, bridge across River Benway. That was when I, 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 I came to school. I ran to my uncle. I said, we have resumed. We have resumed. We have resumed. Then my uncle gave me 400 naira. I used 300 naira to go to Abuja. He gave me what? So I was better off before I travel. If I had kept the 400 naira, it would have been in my pocket. But because I made a trip to Abuja, and then I made 300 back, how much do I have now? 
I was on the bridge when I vowed that till I graduate, I won't cross that bridge in search of anybody again. And I went to campus and I built my altar. And you know what? I didn't cross that bridge. My father had died. These were the people that said, oh, they were going to train us. And my father trained them. My father married my mother when he was already old because he used his life to train those people. My dad was like 15 years older than my mom. In my dad's old age, my mom was still very beautiful. All of them turned their backs. May people turn their back on you so that you can build a altar. I know you said it. You said that's an American amen. <laughs> you know where? Amen, amen. That's America. It's America. I understand that. But you will never. <laughs> ah. I said, I won't go back. If I die, I die. But one thing God, God used my father to show me was the living God that he was trustworthy. I said, I won't go back. Do you know, do you know that few years later, I paid down my uncle's children's school fees because the altar eh, it, it had grown <laughs> Genesis chapter 25 shows us that your altar can be the secret to your provision I know you read statistics and mathematics but I tell you the truth God Pays rewards, your job pays salaries. It will come to pass that you will see that God's rewards can invest all the labors you can put in in that company. If only that altar can grow to maturity, it will not only sustain you, it will sustain generations of time. Finally, before I sit. Sorry, I've tried to sit down many times, but this what is moving me now, they have uh, Genesis 33 verse 20 is around. Genesis 33 verse 20. Maybe we'll do this um, teaching in more detail subsequently. And he erected, still see Isaac erected an altar. And what did he call the name of the altar? In this time, eh, altars had names. This added technology. You know why altars? He started giving altars name so that he could trap the heritages. What did he call this one? He called the altar El Elohim. <laughs> what have you named? Have you named anything before? Huh? Have you given anything name before? The name you bear belongs to somebody. These pioneers found things in the spirit. And the only way you will know that that's the thing they found is that they gave it a name so that when you reach there, it's named. El Elohim Israel. You know, when God encountered Abraham that time, Abraham built the altar unto the God that appeared unto him. But his son had a name for him. His son was operating an advanced program. Much more advanced than the one his father operated. Can you see? These are improvements in the spirit. El Elohim Israel. The God of the house of Israel. Where is blessing? Blessing. Who? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You, you, in the house of that Koja that you came from, you must locate the anointing that is supposed to regulate that house. Huh? So that it shall be said, this is the way, these are the ways of the God of the house of that Koja. You 
we are born naked or not empty. This man influenced generations. They influenced territories. And there are many things hidden in the Middle East today that the people that inhabit those lands do not know. They pitch tents, tents for temporary. They build altars so that even if they move, those altars are there. Two generations later, Abraham's grandson was running from home. He thought he was running by his senses. He didn't know that what was determining where he was running to was the, the magnetic effect of an altar. He thought his will was what was at work. Until when he went to sleep, the Bible says he took stone for pillow. I know you will not do that. He didn't know he was being controlled, but he thought he was he was using the brain of physics that he learned in BSc, the brain of engineering that he learned in uni. He thought that, that was what was helping him to navigate. He took stones from, for pillows, not knowing that the stones he took were particles of the altar his grandfather raised. When he slept on it in the night, when his spiritual senses were blotted out, his physical senses were blotted out, his spiritual senses were activated, and he saw the same line from the spirit realm. And he saw that it was a city. He thought he was the only one there, but he was in the midst of traffic. The road was busy. The road from earth to heaven. And the Bible says that angels were ascending and descending upon him. And in the very gate of the portal, the Son of Man stood there. He must have realized he did not come there by accident. The magnetic effect of an altar regulated him. And so the Bible said, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he saw, there is a magnetic effect. Doesn't matter whether he joins the army and he goes to Somalia to fight. He learns strange ways. The altar will magnet him back. Today I challenge you to be an inventor. And the Lord will take you to deep places in the spirit, uncharted territory in the spirit. And you will gain mileage and wisdom. And you will also give Jehovah a new name. Amen. And she called him El Elohim. Yes, sir. What will you call? What will you call? These men lived and died, and their altars were testament that they gave. And the covenants of those altars regulate territories and nations. What will you build? What will you build? That's my question. What will you build? We seek a man of sufficient stature that will arise, pay the price, so that God will turn his face to his family and look upon the iniquity of the land and stand as a platform on the life of that intercessor to judge, to bring about justice, judgment, and equity, that his grace might be unveiled. Oh my God, oh my God, I challenge you to make a discovery. Because God in this day has decided to make himself available. If only you can build an altar around your encounter. You will trap it and it will, it will become a lifestyle. It will grow to become a culture. It will become the name of a nation. El Elohim. Israel. 